Hey y'all, this is a companion to my last video on designing and laying down a spoil board on my Gatton CNC router. Now in this video, I'm going to get in to VCarve Pro and show you how I drew, then calculated the toolpath to surface it. It looks more intimidating than it really is, so long as you remember a few things. And we'll get into that right now. Okay, here in SketchUp, I took my drawing and I went ahead and I moved this piece of T-Track out. And you'll see why in just a second. Now, if you recall this scene from my previous video, I chucked a felt pen in my router using the half-inch collet. Then I drew a line from the limit switch trigger on the right side of the table all the way across the table to the limit switch trigger on the left side of the table. And I did that for a couple of reasons. Now in this context what it did was it gave me a representation at a glance of where that left limit switch trigger is and where the right limit switch trigger is. And now the reason I needed that was so that I could place my spoil board, the, the strip, the first strip out here and the first strip here, in an area where I could machine it. So when I came in and drew that line in SketchUp, I did a little bit of measuring. I took a hard measurement on my table and then a hard measurement and then a measurement here in the drawing and I discovered that this line ends a quarter of an inch away from the inside of the aluminum angle on both edges. Now when it comes to my T-track the measurement from the outside edge here to this outside edge here is three quarters of an inch. So by starting my spoil board here along this edge flush up against this edge of the T-track and ending it flush up against the edge of this T-track here, I knew that I would be able to machine this entire field here without triggering a limit switch in X on either side, if that makes sense. As we get to working on this, it will make sense to you. So I now know that by using these T-tracks out here on the outside edges that I can machine in X without hitting a limit switch trigger. That's the main takeaway here. So that's one of the things that we need to know when it comes to machining this spoil board and drawing up the toolpath in VCarve. The other thing we need to know is our limits here in Y just by virtue of the way the Gatton CNC is designed when coming down this direction in Y towards the front of the machine the bit will come off of the front of the machine and come out here and just spin an empty space by about oh easily a couple of inches so I have no problems with hitting a limit switch here it just won't happen but when I laid down the spoil board back here if you recall I trimmed up the back edge of the MDF with a quarter inch bit so that tells me that I know for sure I have a quarter of an inch back here to play with and I won't hit a limit also when I drew that line I had my y-axis all the way back to within one-eighth of hitting that trigger so technically I have about three-eighths of an inch out here of space that I can machine along and let the bit come over about three-eighths of an inch without triggering a limit. Now I'm not going to go that far. So with those measurements in mind and knowing that, that I can easily run my bit a quarter of an inch beyond here, a quarter of an inch beyond here, I can machine this entire surface in Y without hitting a limit, tricks, limit switch trigger. Again, the T-track is just slightly under three quarters of an inch wide. So the width of my spoil board in X 
is approximately just under an inch narrower than my max capacity in X. So I can easily m trim or machine the whole surface of my spoil board without a limit switch trigger uh, on either side. So let's take all of those measurements, my physical dimensions of my spoil board at its widest point in X, and we'll take the physical length of the spoil board in Y at the longest point, and we'll head over into VCarve and we'll start drawing out a toolpath. Okay, here in VCarve, we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a new file. And we brought all of our measurements in with us from uh, off of the CNC table itself, and we have them handy here close by. Now, what I want to do up here in my job setup, job size in XY, I want to go ahead and I want to enter the physical width of my entire spoil board. And in my case, it's 50 and 3 sixteenths of an inch. So I'll go ahead and enter 50.1875. Okay, and then my height in Y, the physical dimension at its longest point, is 32 and 13 sixteenths. So I'll go 32.8125. Okay, the material thickness is three quarters of an inch, and I'm setting my Z0 to the top of the material, the top of the spoil board itself. Now, I'm not going to use an offset. I'm going to set my XY datum position to the center, meaning the center of my spoil board. And, of course, I'm using inches. I have my modeling resolution set to the standard, fastest, and the material appearance I'm not really concerned with. So we'll go ahead and we'll accept those settings right now. So we have a physical representation of my spoil board. Now, let me say right here from the start that all of the measurements that I'm using are simply for reference only. Do not use my measurements. Do not use my um, safety factor over here when we make this uh, tool path. Uh, don't use any of my measurements. I'm simply using these as a reference so you get an idea for what I'm trying to do. Now, in order to create a toolpath to machine this entire surface, we need to draw a rectangle around it. We want to draw a rectangle just a little bit larger than our actual spoil board surface. So the reason we want to do that is if we make a create a rectangle that's the exact same size, when the bit starts lowering itself into the material, it's going to do so well within the uh, spoil board itself and start machining along. Well, after the toolpath has finished running, these corners here will not be trimmed down the software knows the diameter of the bit that I'm going to use and it makes allowances keeping the center line of that bit well inside so that the it so that the bit doesn't cut outside that perimeter what we want to do is make that perimeter larger than the surface that it has to machine just large enough to where that bit will come over and go past the edge and actually trim out here some and the same thing in Y. We want it to come out here just past so that it trims some out here. And between the two, they'll get this corner. And this is the same on all four corners, obviously. So we'll come over here and we'll into the Create Vector section and we'll click on Draw Rectangle. And what I want to do is I want to create this rectangle to be about a quarter of an inch wider than my spoil board so that the bit will travel about an eighth of an inch to the outside over the outside edge of the spoil board on each side and I want to draw the rectangle to where the bit will machine off of the spoil board back here about a quarter of an inch and the same thing up here in the front 
that will ensure that the bit actually gets these corners without any problems. I can come along and I can draw uh, a rectangle, do some math and add everything to uh, my measurements, my X and Y measurements, or I can just go ahead and use the calculators that are built into vCarve Pro and let vCarve Pro do it. Here in the draw rectangle form, I'm going to anchor the rectangle on the center of the drawing. I'm going to use square corners and I'm going to come down here and in my width in X, I'm going to use the calculator to let it figure out how wide I want to go. So I want to use my, I've highlighted whatever numbers are in there, backspace to delete them so I have a flashing cursor and I'll enter X plus 0.25 meaning I want the width of this rectangle to be a quarter of an inch wider than my X measurement in the job setup. And then I'll hit equals and it enters the width of the rectangle that's going to create. Same thing down here. I'm going to set the size to the height in Y by typing Y plus 0.5 then hit equals and it does the math for me. So it, what it's done is it's taking the height of my material in Y that I set up over in job setup and added that half inch to it. Then when I hit create it creates this rectangle slightly bigger than the physical size of the spoil board. We'll go ahead and we'll hit close. Now it's offset because I had it set to center, uh, to anchor on the center, but it's not lined up. I don't have an equal amount of space over here and over here. So I'll go ahead and I'll select the rectangle, come over here under transform objects and select align selected objects. I want to align this selected object to the material vertically and horizontally. So I'll click this button here in the center and you can see our rectangle has shifted and is now hanging. Our rectangle is an eighth of an inch larger over here on this side, eighth of an inch larger on this side, a quarter of an inch larger down here, and a quarter of an inch larger up here, centered on the material. Now we can go ahead and close and we are now ready to start calculating the toolpath. This is the only vector we need to draw for this file at all. Now is a good time to go ahead and save this file. So I'm going to go ahead and come up to the file menu, click save as, and I'm going to go ahead and put it on my desktop and what I will do is call it um, spoil board surface and save. So now if anything happens, I haven't lost this part of it anyway. So we're ready to go ahead and start calculating the toolpath. So with that rectangle selected, we'll go ahead and switch over to the toolpaths tab. And I'm going to use a pocketing toolpath op operation to clear all the material out of here. So we'll go ahead and select a pocket toolpath. Now I want to go ahead and put my start depth at zero which will be the top of the spoil board itself and I'm going to cut my cutting depth I want to be 20 thousandths per pass so we'll go 0 0.020 for my cutting depth then oh, click my show advanced toolpath options I clicked off to the side and that got rid of it now for the tool, I have an inch and a quarter surfacing bit. Well, it's actually a straight mortising bit, but I use it as a surfacing bit. And I set it up as an end mill. So if I go ahead and select that bit, I have it highlighted over here. The diameter of the bit's an inch and a quarter. 
it will make a pass depth of not quite a half inch. I'm setting my step over to 40 percent. This is the one of the important ones to uh, remember on this panel here. I want my step over to be 40 percent of the bit's diameter. Okay, My spindle speed is irrelevant here because I don't have a spindle that's controlled by Mach 3. Um, I'm using a variable speed router and for this bit I usually have it set to around 15, 16,000 RPM. So just by coincidence this is close to correct but I'm going to basically ignore my spindle RPMs. My feed rate for this bit is 60 inches per minute. We'll get into this a little bit more later on. My plunge rate is 20 inches per minute. So go ahead and hit OK. And for 20 thousandths depth of cut, that bit's going to do it in one pass, which is fine. I'm not going to use a larger area clearance tool. I don't have a larger tool. If I did, I would be using it. <laughs> and OK, so down here in the clear pocket panel, I'm going to go with a raster toolpath. And that's simply because I prefer to have all of the machining marks going in one direction. And regardless of how well you've trammed your router, you will have machining marks. I'm going to go ahead and cut climb. And speaking of how well you trammed your router, if you watched my video on tramming the router, you'll know that I ended up with a forward nod on my router of one and a half thousandths. I ended up with half a thou of twist, counterclockwise twist in my router. Well, the counterclockwise twist is not really that bad. That's actually pretty good. That one and a half thou of nod, however, could cause me problems if I start rastering this toolpath across the width of the spoil board in X. Because that one and a half thou of forward nod means that the front edge of that bit's going to cut just slightly deeper, about three quarters of a thou, than the back of that bit will. So I might get some slight ridges along the x-axis of my spoil board if I raster cut it going from side to side. So in my case what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do a raster angle of 90 degrees. And what that's going to do is that's going to make my raster pattern run from front to rear. Uh, now the next is the profile pass. A pocketing toolpath will come along and it'll hollow out, hog out all the material here and then with this setting it will make one last pass all the way around the profile of the pocket. I don't want it to do that. I want it to come over here and do that profile pass first. Meaning that when I first start running this toolpath, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to come along and it's going to machine all the way around the profile of this toolpath, then of this pocket rather. Then it'll pick up and come over here and start machining in Y. I would prefer to have it do that profile toolpath first. That way, if there is any shingling created by the bit running along this edge back here, it's done before I machine the rest of the spoil board and hopefully this raster pattern will remove that shingling. So this is just for my sanity. You may or may not have to do this. Now I'm not going to add any kind of a pocket allowance, but I am going to ramp my plunge moves. And the reason for that is because the bit that I'm using does not have a cutter that runs all along the bottom of the bit. Most surfacing bits of this size don't. So you don't want this bit to come over to the area it's going to start machining and just plunge straight down because there's going to be an area in the center that will not get cut. 
and technically what you're having is a slow motion crash. We want to ramp in the plunge move and I want it to ramp in over a distance of double my bit's diameter or more. Now I have a uh, inch and a quarter bit in here so I'm going to ramp my plunge moves over a distance of 2.5 inches. What that means is instead of plunging straight down it, the z-axis will start to plunge and the y-axis will move forward two and a half inches as it plunges. Once the z gets down to my twenty thousandths cutting depth it will stop back up and machine away any material it missed then start forward on this profile toolpath at the very beginning. So we want to ramp in the plunge moves and using something that does not have a cutter all along all the way along the bottom of the bit. Now we come down here and I'm going to name this toolpath spoil board surface 020. That's a signal to me that this is going to remove 20 thousandths per pass. Now take a quick glance back over everything, make sure I've got it all, and we'll go ahead and hit calculate. And you can see here now in the toolpath how it's going to go up and down in Y rather than across side to side in X. So I will go ahead and my material selected is pine over here. Uh, my machined area color, I'm going to go ahead and have it do a toolpath color and the color I'm going to select for this toolpath just so it stands out, I'm going to go with blue. This way everything that's machined off of here will appear blue. Everything that's not ma machined off will still look like this pine color that the uh, material is. And we'll go ahead and make sure it's selected and preview the selected toolpath. It does the profile pass first, then comes along and machines the rest of the spoil board uh, along the y-axis, stepping over in the x 40 percent after each pass. And here we go. It's applied that blue color and now I can come in here and zoom and move my 3D drawing around and see yes it has machined off the corners. I don't have any pine visible on my corners nor along any of the edges. So this is the tool path that I can use. Now if I had any unmachined area showing in the corners, I would zoom in on those corners and see which direction, whether it be X or Y, I need to enlarge that rectangle, keeping within my little self-imposed safety factor so I don't hit a limit switch trigger. But in my case, I don't need to do that. Moving my bit, allowing my bit to machine an eighth inch over the edge of the spoil board in X on each side and a quarter of an inch past the spoil board in Y on the front and rear edges was enough to machine those corners along with the rest of the spoil board. So I can go ahead and reset my preview, close my preview window, and now I want to go ahead and take a look at the summary to include a net time estimate. Now if you recall when we were looking at the bit I said there would be more later on the feed rate and I had that feed rate set at 60 inches per minute. If we look at the total machining time we're looking at 56 minutes 28 seconds to run this toolpath once. This is why this is a good example of why I tend to ignore the toolpath summary and estimated machining time because I can tell you right now I am not going to machine that spoil board at 60 inches per minute.
60 inches per minute is a good starting point for that bit. When I get this toolpath loaded into Mach 3 and get it started running, it will go ahead and it'll start this profile toolpath, it'll ramp itself in and start cutting at 60 inches per minute. In Mach 3 I can bump up that feed rate. I can override that 60 inches per minute. Mach 3 will let it override. We can bump it up to 300 percent of that feed rate. That's its max limit. It won't let you go past 300 percent. But 300 percent of 60 inches per minute is 180 inches per minute. Now I don't know if I'm going to be running it that fast but I have the ability if the material and the bit will allow me. Now how will I know? Well, what I do is I start bumping it up and Mach 3 when you start overriding your feed rate and you start bumping it up, it bumps it up in 10 percent increments. So every time I bump that up 10 percent it's going to increase that feed rate in this case by 6 inches per minute. 10 percent of 60 inches per minute is 6 inches per minute. But I'll be able to keep bumping that up until I either get chatter or until I max out at 180 inches per minute. Now some folks have asked me what chatter is. If you see or hear, if you see your gantry shuddering, shaking, or quivering while you're cutting, that's chatter. You're pushing it too hard, you need to slow it down. You need to slow your feed rate down. If you hear, you don't see any shuddering or shaking, but you hear the bit, what sounds like the bit shuddering or shaking or shimmying. It, uh, it's a vibrating yang 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 sound. If, and that's a technical term. Uh, <laughs> if you hear that kind of a sound, you're pushing it a little bit too fast. Slow down your feed rate. So when I bump up my feed rates, I bump them up and keep bumping until I hear that or see that shuddering, then I'll back it off again 10 percent per notch. I'll back it off until I no longer have any uh, chatter, shuddering, shimmying, or that loud noise. Then I'll let it continue to run at that feed rate. What that does is that throws this time estimate right out the window. Because if I ends up to where I can machine this spoil board at double that feed rate of 120 inches per minute, I've cut this estimated time of 56 minutes in half. If I can push it a little bit further, say 140 inches per minute, this whole estimate here is just gone. It's out the window. So that's why I don't even bother looking at it. So this says it's going to take 56 minutes and 28 seconds to run this toolpath operation. It won't because I will not be running it at 60 inches per minute. I will be running it faster. How fast? I don't know yet and I won't know until I get out there and it starts cutting. Every piece of material is different even two identical pieces of material may have different densities. So there's no real 100 percent accurate way of guessing. So from here I can just make sure I've got a check mark in my spoil board surface and I can go up here to save toolpath. Select that, output all visible toolpaths to one file. Well there's only one toolpath so we're pretty safe there. It's telling me right now that the spoil board surface 020 toolpath is selected using the 1.25 inch end mill. I have my post processor set to the correct post processor for my machine and I'll go ahead and hit save toolpaths to file. Now I'm going to go ahead and call this spoil board surface 020 as it's already set in here and save this I would save this to a flash drive to take outside onto the CNC, but for this demonstration I'm just putting it on my desktop. Click Save, and there we have it. We have a spoil board surfacing toolpath that will machine the entire surface of the spoil board 
without missing a corner and without triggering a limit switch either in Y or in X. And by limiting the depth of cut on this toolpath to 20 thousandths of an inch, we shouldn't have any nasty surprises as so long as you zero your CNC to the top surface of your spoil board. So those are the steps that I took to create the toolpath that I used to surface my spoil board. Now again, the measurements that I used were for my CNC router. I highly encourage you to take hard measurements of your spoil board and find your limits whether you have switches or not so you don't crash an axis. So I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, give me a thumbs up down there. I really do appreciate it. Now I've put links in the description to Dave Gatton's homepage where you can get information on a Gatton CNC kit of your own. I've also put a link in the description to the website article I've written that accompanies this video. And I highly encourage you to check out these website articles because sometimes they contain information that I didn't get a chance to put into the video here. So if you'd like to follow along with what I'm doing out here in the shop, consider subscribing to my channel. Now whether you subscribe to my channel or not, please hit that little bell down there and set your notifications so that you'll be informed the next time I post a video. So, after all said and done, I'd like to thank you very, very much for watching. Y'all take care.